pulpit's here is smaller than at faith, and so I have to make use of the real estate. <clears throat> but we are back in the book of Genesis after a week off last week. Thank you, Brother Robert, for your remarkable labors on our behalf, and teaching us to chant the Psalms. That was a joy. I'm very thankful for that. Genesis 29, <clears throat> and I will read the first 30 verses, so another mound of text as we work our way through this wonderful, incredible book. Genesis 29, give careful attention now to the reading of God's holy word. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, it is well, and see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and she told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, well, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. They seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, well, it is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so, and he completed her week. Then Laban gave his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went in to Rachel also. And he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. The word of the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the assurance that it gives us that you are a God of good providence, whether it's coming to the well in a clear blessing or whether it's a season of frustration. It is all under your watchful care as a good father 
who is maturing his people. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I said, we, we have another mountain of text to climb. So we'll get straight to work today. And there's really three main movements in the sweep, in the drama of this text that I want to draw our attention to. Three main movements. One, Jacob's joy at the well. Two, Laban's deception at the wedding. And then three, Jacob's patience in the waiting. So with that, let's turn to the text, considering first the movement of Jacob's joy at the well. And this section, this larger whole section, begins with a very important word for us. The word is then. Then Jacob went on his journey, and this is important because it connects us back to the scene before. So where Jacob had the vision of the stairway to heaven, and he heard the Lord speak the confirmation of blessing upon him, that he would be the father of a massive multitude. So there's a, a great gust of hopeful heavenly wind in Jacob's sails as he moves onward from Bethel in search now of a wife, an important part of fulfilling the promise. In verses 1 through 3, we find Jacob lifting his eyes eastward, and he sees a pasture land with a well and three separate groups of sheep. And we're going to see some significant overlap with this story and with chapter 24 when Abraham sends his servant to go find a wife for Isaac, for Jacob's dad. It will center around a well. It will have the providential fingerprints of God upon every step. And Laban is going to play a very key character. Last time he played the role of good brother to sister Rebecca. Now he will play the role of father to Rachel. And we'll remember why the well is such a fitting picture for this scene. We talked about this last time. For in scripture, the, the well, a, a well, of course, it's a literal well, obviously, but it also represents salvation and life and marriage as well. And so our man Jacob, in search of a wife, has come upon a well which is a good start. But we learn early on here an interesting detail, namely that this well was covered with a large stone. Perhaps this was to protect the well from drying out, or perhaps it was to protect the sheep from falling in. But at this point, the salvation, marriage picture is, is covered. Regardless, moving it apparently took a team effort by the shepherds, which is interesting that that is specifically noted. They would all have to work together in order to remove the stone from the well. And this is all, of course, setting the stage for what is to come. In verses 4 through 7, we have Jacob engaging the shepherds that he has happened upon in this journey. And he engages them with with great fervor and with kindness and with hopeful regards. He, he calls them brothers, which is, which is noteworthy. And in the context, from where he's coming from, it's, it's worth noting, when one is confirmed and, and when one is encouraged in the promises of God, which Jacob was, all that is ours through the gospel, all the yes and amen that God has sovereignly spoken, it animates our whole being. That there is a, a hope that is contagious. That there is a kindness and a dignity that we default to with our interactions towards others, even strangers. Or as J.I. Packer says in, in the book that we're studying in our men's group, Knowing God, he says, those who know God have a great energy for God. And so despite Jacob's weary journey, despite his fugitive status, despite that his back is on everything he knew, his home, he's coming off an encounter with God where he had been confirmed in the grace that was his from God. And so that, that there's a freshness, there, there's a hopeful vitality that seems to be carrying him along on what it could have been a fearful and lonesome journey. 
So after greeting them with this regard, he then sees if they can help him get his bearings. And remember, back when he set off, his mother tells him to flee to Haran and specifically to go to her brother Jacob. And then Isaac, his father, adds to that. Yes, do that and also go and seek out a wife from his people as well. So he asks the shepherds, where do you come from? And they say, from Haran. Okay, check number one. Question two, well, do you happen to know Laban? And they say, for sure. In fact, his daughter should be here any minute with his sheep to water at the well. So check two and check three. Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. And so here we see the Lord establishing Jacob's steps. And then we have the great moment. As Jacob and the shepherds are talking shop about wells and sheeps, and these types of things, we see her. And she ascends the horizon right on cue. So cue, gust of wind to throw her hair around. Backlit sun, she comes right over the horizon. And Jacob sees the most adorable shepherdess he has ever seen in all of his life, leading his mother's brother's sheep. You notice how that's repeated over and over again. That's the Holy Spirit saying, don't miss this. The providence of God over the journey of his people. And then, and I love this part. Jacob, like any single guy in the presence of a pretty girl, looks for a great feat of physical strength to try to accomplish. And so he goes to the well and he, he channels his inner Samson. And he essentially bench presses the stone off the well that typically takes a team of shepherds to lift. The Lord is rolling the stone away, as it were, for the line of the seed of salvation. And then he, he draws water for her sheep, probably flexing every time he pulls up the water. You know what I'm talking about. I know Zach Hook knows what I'm talking about. And then he goes... And runs and he kisses her. Now, don't get carried away. This is a familial on the cheek, not romance novel stuff. And then tells her who he is and he makes his intentions clear. So single guys, this is what we might call taking initiative, <laughs> to put it mildly. He shows with his actions that he's a man who can protect and provide. And then he confirms his intentions with his words. There, there's a whole theology of courtship in these one or two verses. Just don't, don't lead out with the kiss here. Wait, wait on that. From there, Rachel goes and she gets her dad Laban, just like Rebecca back in Genesis 24, went to go get Laban. And Laban is initially elated by this also, and he welcomes Jacob into the home. You are certainly bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You are my people. And so Jacob is full of joy. After his encounter with God, you will be a father of a great multitude. The promise of the Lord is coming true, and the path in the wilderness has led to a well. And it is well with his soul. Or is it? Well, we find that Jacob works there initially for a month, at which point Laban makes the seemingly honorable move. Or is it a trap? of acknowledging Jacob should be paid for his work. And he tells Jacob to name his price. And it's here in the narrative that the first cloud on the horizon starts to appear, that there is some deeper drama about to brew. Because Moses, Moses being the writer of Genesis, he now gives us a detail that doesn't seem to fit into the context, but obviously will. He tells us that Labam actually has two daughters, Leah, who we're told is weak in the eyes, which is a bit ambiguous. Is she, does she not see well? Is this some sort of physical frailty that she has? 
Well, whatever it is, the meaning is clear when she's contrasted with Rachel, who was beautiful in form and appearance and the one that Jacob loved. Jacob was not attracted romantically to Leah. He had no interest in her. So Jacob names his price. He says he'll work seven years if he can marry Rachel. This is his dowry. This will be the work that he gives for his bride. And Laban agrees. And the deal is made and the hands are shaken. And Jacob, now mind you, when we do the math, is 77 years old at this point. He gets to work for seven years to get Rachel. So as a church, to put this in context, we are just three years old. So if Jacob had started on day one of Pilgrim Hill, not even halfway through yet of what he is working to get Rachel. And yet he's in love. So in love, in fact, that the text says it was easy for him. So worth it when he saw the joy set before him. And so he works, dreaming of the moment when he can finally get the harvest that he's really interested in. So the seven years are fulfilled, the celebration is thrown, the marriage feast is had, and it is well with Jacob's soul. Or is it? And here we transition in the movement from Jacob's joy at the well to Laban's deception at his wedding. Because as Jacob leaves the feast and he goes in to his wife, a great and treacherous scheme happens. A, a great bait and switch for the ages is run by Laban. And it's hard to really understand how this was accomplished. <laughs> Perhaps he partied a little too hard at, at the wedding. Perhaps the woman remained veiled in the dark the whole night. We don't know. But the woman he actually goes into is Leah. Goes into is Leah, not Rachel. And it's not until the next morning when this awkward turn of events is discovered. And I love how verse 25 renders it. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Yeah, I bet that was something for Jacob to behold. And so he marches out, confronts Laban. And Laban gives the lame excuse saying, well, in our country, the Mary, the oldest one always is married off. This is just kind of standard procedure, which is ridiculous. Of course, if that were true, Laban should have said so from the outset because it was, did you notice, it was very specific. I will work seven years for the younger one, Rachel. Now, this is Laban showing his cards. He's taken advantage of Jacob's zeal and love for Rachel, and he's dishonored both of his daughters using them as pawns on his farm. That ends up causing great strife in the family, and we even get the hint of that in the text, where Jacob's affections, after he has them both, were clearly far more for Rachel than Leah, which is a terrible position to put a daughter in. I mean, poor Leah. And now Laban makes his play, and he says, you can have Rachel and Leah. Just give me seven more years of free labor. Now, at this point, how would you respond? Like, really try to put yourself. Seven years, this is what I'm going after. Bait and switch. Mm, seven more years. How about that? How would you respond to this frustration? Now, you're only halfway done. And now you're under my mercy. Well, we find out how Jacob responds at the beginning of verse 28. And it says, remarkably, Jacob did so. He completed the week of Leah, receives Rachel, serves Laban another seven years. And this brings us to the, the final movement in our time from Jacob's joy at the well, Laban's deception at his wedding, and finally, Note Jacob's patience in the waiting. Because what's so remarkable about the end of this section is how understated it is. Jacob has dealt this great deception 
that will keep him under the thumb of Laban. Yet we find no word of complaint, no breath of self-pity, no sense of anything other than patiently keeping his hand at the plow and pressing on in faith, even through an incredibly, what would have been probably frustrating, prolonged circumstance. And here's the principle that, that I want for us as a church to see in this story. And it's this. God doesn't just allow seasons of frustration. God ordains seasons of frustration. And that is a huge distinction. He doesn't just allow them to happen. He ordains them. What Laban did was wrong. It was frustrating. And it was just as much a part of God's providential plan for Jacob as was his happening upon the well when Rachel was coming to it. And we know this, spoiler alert, because Leah has Judah, which is the lineage of Christ. Next week. Both the easy joy, well, and hard frustration, seven more unjust years, were ordained by the Lord for Jacob. It was part of his faith training. God had ordained great things for Jacob. He ordained that he would become a man who would wrestle with God and win somehow and be transfigured into Israel, which means wrestles with God. And so his faith would need to be iron strong. And so the Lord, right on the heels of great joy and clear providence, remember how many times the Holy Spirit emphasizes the providence of God here, right on the heels of that, he ordained a seven-year frustration as a hidden providence. And the test was, how would he respond to that? It's easy to respond to the well moment. It's easy to respond to the gorgeous shepherdess that you know is the one for you. But what about this? Would, would he be rash? Would he rage and kick? Would Jacob sink into a victim mentality that just assume the whole world's against him and he's powerless? Would he flee and abandon the bridge that actually was leading to the promise? Or would he be patient? Would he be faithful in the season he was in, even though it was unfair, which it was? Well, we see that he chose the latter. He put his head down, he pushed on for another seven years, and Jacob grew where God had planted him in that season and gained the invaluable fruit of true faith and true maturity being forged in the process. And so th this is what I want us to get into our bones. And it's understanding that the Lord really is committed to growing us up, to maturing us, to, to instilling in us a joyful resilience. And yes, he'll give us seasons of easy joy, of the sunshine of his kind sovereignty, of that job that you had so desperately wanted and he gives it to you and it's clear that it's from him and that's wonderful. And in his wisdom, he will trot out scenes that we never would have written into the play, that we think should have landed on the editing room, editing room floor. And that's just as much of his kindness as the former. He does it to humble us and to mature us and then to exalt us. Because if we're honest, we can easily think that we are much farther along in our sanctification than we actually are, can't we? Aren't you sometimes shocked by how you thought you were getting near the summit and you realize you're still at the foothills of the, the journey? We, we can think because we've deepened in our understanding of scripture or in our understanding of doctrine or in our appreciation of liturgy or because we've brushed up on church history some or whatever you feel self-impressed by or attempted to, we can look at those things and think that we've actually made true progress in Christian maturity. Now, all those things are good and helpful and wonderful and good gifts that God gives us, but they aren't the test 
The test is the Laban season. When the Lord says action on the frustration that the builder that seems so trustworthy hangs you out to dry. The new job that seems so great, well, the boss finds out you're a Christian and he becomes overbearing and unreasonable and unfair towards you. Or you get the baby, but now you're on week seven of 2 a.m. wake-up calls in a row. Or you've had your third health scare in a year that takes you down really hard. Or whatever your Laban season is, the unexpected season of prolonged frustration, how do we respond to that? What's our reflex? Is it, is it grumbling? Is it fear? Is it resentment? Is it anger? Is it a victim complex? Or do we by faith flinch forward as happy warriors, keeping our hands on the plow? This is the true test. And this is what determines our response to the test. It is, do we trust the Lord? Do we trust the Lord? Do we believe all the way down that God doesn't simply allow circumstances, but he ordains them, ordains them to, to grow us and to take away the veneer of maturity and to actually put real oak into our soul? He ordains us to, to, to make us rely not on ourselves or not on our circumstances, but on him, the God of resurrection and our good father who disciplines and trains those whom he loves. And when we begin to understand that, have a big vision of God's providence, we'll know that what seems at first like a setback in a circumstance is actually an opportunity for a promotion in our faith. As Peter said, that is more precious than gold. Or, as the wonderful catechism says, question eight of the Heidelberg, it asks, what does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them all by his providence? To which we answer, well, if that's true, and it is, we can be patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. And our Lord and our God, we thank you that you are not a distant deity that just created the world and then took a leave of absence. We thank you that you are not just a sovereign king, which you are, but you are not just that. You are also our kind father who is providentially working all things together for our good, for your glory. And Father, we pray as a church, especially for those who are in Laban seasons of frustration, that, that together we would turn our eyes to you again and believe we would rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we would say, rejoice. And now we would pray the way our Lord taught us to pray.